Hey, welcome back to ZK Master Tech. Today, we're gonna to cover part two of the S780 combine inspection. Um, I'm gonna take you down the left-hand side of the machine. I'm also gonna take you inside of the cleaning shoe. Um, you're gonna notice that this combine has a land code, a shutoff kit for the cross augers in the grain tank. And I'll put a link in the video for that. And I'll also put a link in the description and that'll take you to the Sloan Express website where you guys can check that out further. Let's get into it. Now that I'm around the tire, we can check this upper feeder house drive belt. We'll spin it around and check the condition of the belt. This is the five speed gear case here. And this is what's changing our speeds on the feeder house. It's basically like a power shift transmission with five gears in it. And then we wanna check the condition of this mount, make sure it's not cracking anywhere, um, especially where it mounts underneath here and um, we'll check the u-joints make sure they're being getting greased we'll check this z-bar here this is what connects the concave grates all together and attaches to the the linkage here and then this bar rotates by this motor right here this electric motor turns this gear which is like a worm gear and there's another gear attached to it you can't see it but there you go so it turns this bar and that's what moves this concave up and down and that's what we call threshing clearance because it's adjusting the distance between these grates down here and the threshing elements of the rotor so you want to take a good look at these this one's been replaced before it's still got the sticker on it because it probably either broke or started cracking or something you want to make sure all your bolts are in place and not missing. We we'll pay attention for cracks along here. And this is why I opened up the threshing clearance all the way so I could see to the top of this Z-bar. Because if you have it up, it's going to be hidden behind this channel right here. And it all looks good. I like to feel how much tension each rod has on it. You know, if one's super tight and one's super loose you want to make sure they they have you know similar tension they're not sometimes they're not exact but see this one's a little tighter than this one and i recommend leveling these every thousand separator hours because there can be a huge discrepancy in what your display says on the position sensor versus what it is mechanically so over time you can wear all the you know the threshing elements wear these grates wear and eventually zero is not zero anymore zero could be 15 millimeter and 15 millimeter makes a huge difference in the machine and how it performs so if your threshing clearance isn't mechanically zeroed you could be too wide and say you're in corn and you want to be on 30 you could actually be 45 and not even know it even though it says 30 in the in the cab so if this adjustment isn't right then you're just trying to make up for it with all the other adjustments in the machine so this is a very important adjustment to make sure that it's mechanically zeroed and then when you get done you'll be able to tell how far it's off where these stops are so the concave raises up until it touches this bolt here and these are your stops so say we're 15 millimeters off when we get done zeroing this, then when we readjust these stops, you'll be able to see how much thread difference there was between before and after. And the procedure, I'm not gonna go through the procedure in this video for leveling the concave, but the procedure is in the owner's manual to level the concave. 
Then we're in here, we inspect the trough. And we want to look at the, the bulkhead. So this plate right here, where all the shoe augers actually bolt to it, and it holds the bearing carrier for the shoe drive shaft that we looked at earlier. But they're known for cracking right here, right where the, the bearing carrier is welded. So if that drive shaft has any run out or whatever in it, it could flex that carrier and then it breaks this backing plate right here. And they have made improvements. I think in 16, they put more welded gussets on there. Because I know if you order this part for an older machine, it, it has the new welded gussets on it. So normally they crack right here on each side. So on the left side, it's always the inside shoe auger just to the left of it. And then the other side, it'd be the right inside shoe auger just to the, the right of it. And this one's in good shape. And so if you didn't want to crawl underneath the machine, you can check the, you know, the bearings like this and you can see that that one's loose. And we also check the rear bearings here. Make sure they're tight. You can see we got not ex super excessive backlash, but it's, it's there. And then I like to look up in here, right along here is where these mounts can break. Especially if you got U-joints that don't get greased or that drive shaft's out of balance, or you got a failed U-joint, it can cause enough vibration it'll actually break this mount that this gear case sits on. So you want to take a good look at that. So here we're gonna check the condition of the cleaning fan on the left hand side. Make sure that this tone wheel's good and it's not loose. Sometimes those can get loose and slide off. Check the bearing, pick up on the shaft. And then we'll go through and check all these blades, make sure that they're in good condition and not breaking off. One thing I do wanna mention is there's a plastic retainer in here that has plastic Christmas tree fasteners or clips that go in there and hold that on. And if this piece, plastic piece breaks or um, those clips are missing, that plastic can actually wear through right here on the fan blade and it'll start rubbing into that aluminum fan blade and then eventually they'll break off. So you wanna make sure that this piece is secured tightly. So now we're here on the left inside still and we're going to check the shoe drive shaft bearing i just take a bar stick it in here and pry out this direction try to get some movement out of there and um, we'll check the pitman arm bearings here and here's our pitman arms and then they attach to our shaker arms and in the shaker arms we'll check these rubber bushings look for cracking or the bushing coming out of the arm itself and this one is attached to the chaffer frame. This one down here is attached to the sieve frame. And then we've got the rear sway arms as well. And up here, I'll have to take the shield off here and then we'll be able to see the return pan shaker arm as well. So now that I got that shield off, I can look at this connection point here where this front main chaffer swing arm attaches to the return pan. And then we also look in here where the the bolt attaches and make sure that that weld isn't cracked and it's in good condition. And then while we're in here, we'll check the, this is the tailings return. So whenever it comes out of the rethresher, which is what's different on an A-class machine, we have this extra auger in here. This is, so we're returning the tailings back to the return pan instead of putting it back into the rotor in the concave the threshing area and they do that to increase capacity because we're not putting extra recycled material back in here we're re-threshing it in the re-thresher and then dumping it onto the return pan to run it back over the shoe so we'll get in here and check the bearing on this auger here it looks good We'll check this tube for any cracks. Make sure that it's tight. 
Then we'll go in and we'll put the, there's a little shift lever right here. We'll shift it into neutral and then we'll roll this rotor over with a pry bar while we look in here and check all the tines. So, I'm gonna just reach a bar in here, turn this rotor. We're gonna check all these separating tines because those can break off, they hit a rock or something. And we're checking the rotor, the skin of it, the, the shell, I should say. Make sure that there's no holes poked in it. Listen to it. If you had a bad bearing, you'd hear a thump, thump, thump. Spin smoothly. So then I'll do the same thing. I'm going to check these threshing elements in here. This is where all the main threshing is done. So this is where the corn is being taken off the cob or the beans out of the pod. And before I check this, I ran that concave back up so I can see better. look down inside there and check the flight on the front of the rotor there's flighting and just looks like a kind of like a coarse wood screw and it's taking that crop flow that's kind of flat and then it's just it's threading its way into that crop flow and then the crop flow threads its way around the rotor and spins through this rotor housing and it's grinding against these round bars and then these separating grades Here I'm going to check the carrier bearing on this drive shaft. You got your primary universal drive shaft. It's two pieces, and there's a carrier bearing here in the middle, bolts up here, and we're just going to pry up on this joint here. Make sure that that carrier bearing is tight. And it is. You joints feel good. You also want to inspect these rotor hoods because if you get something in there, rock, fence post, something, it can poke a hole through here. You can actually sometimes crack this, this framework, this channel right here as well. That all looks good. Here are the air filters for the after treatment debris management system. And it's back full. So that's good. We're gonna take this battery cover off. big old batteries in there. So I like to open that up so I can visually inspect all the connections. 
it obviously starts and runs okay, so. Batteries don't seem weak. I mean, if we were we were questioning the conditions of the batteries, we could always load test them. Yeah. Check the shaker arms. I like to use a gear inch indexing pry bar because I can adjust the angle. We're looking for movement in here and in here. I mean, it's gonna move a little bit because it's just rubber bushings. So I'm looking for excessive movement. And also, also I'll take a kind of a mental note. I'll look at the, the clearance here on the seals, on the sift frame and the chaffer frame, and make sure that they're not rubbing excessively. I want to make sure it's not tighter on one side more than the other. We want it to run in the center. So I just kind of take a look at those, stick my finger in there, see how much clearance we got, and we'll check it on the back too. So here we'll check the, this is the clean grain auger, left hand side. Check this bearing, it's good. Put the tone wheel on it, speed sensor, wiring, etc. So on a A-class machine, you have your batteries on the left hand side instead of on the, the right hand side. And then you've got your load center up here you got your master fuses and then you got your your load center with all your little micro fuses in it and all the power connections for it so we'll look over that make sure all the connections are good and there's no corrosion or wiring damage and then here you got your your main hydraulic valve block here so we can inspect that leaks wiring all that and then you got your, your here's the back side of it and all your Hose connections going in there, so we'll look at all that. We just got hoses everywhere on this unit. And on this combine, being final tier four, is you have a lot of extra stuff on the side. So we looked at these filters here, but that's drawn filtered air through here into a blower. This is like a, a root style supercharger and it's being turned from the main engine gear case. There's a serpentine belt that runs around here, turns this blower, and it's blowing filtered, pressurized air, try not to trip and die, into this after treatment enclosure. So in here, on a final tier four unit, we have, this is where our exhaust filter, our DPF, our DOC, and our DEF system, so our SCR, Selective Catalyst Reduction, our AOC, all those components are in this after treatment enclosure. So it gets really hot in here, you know, exhaust can get 1200 degrees during a regeneration. So the exhaust is coming out of the engine going in here and then it's going through the DOC and the DPF and the SCR and we got all our DEF components in there and then we're blowing that air into here, so we pressurize this after, after treatment enclosure to keep a positive air pressure in there so we can keep dust and debris out of this enclosure to help minimize fires. Another thing that's different on these A-class machines is, you know, we have our, it's hard to see it, but we have our hydrostatic pump up here for our pro drive system. And then it's spawned into a, a transfer gear case that's turning a variable axial pump. So we just have one pump instead of a stack of pumps um, like the sixes and seven class machines have. And those six and seven class machines are an open center hydraulic system. And this is a closed center hydraulic system. And I'm not going to get into how all that works right now, but I'm just trying to cover, you know, the differences between, you know, a seven class and an eight class machine. So when you jump to an A-class, you're gonna have a closed center system. So we have one pump and it can vary the flow based on load sense, kind of like how a tractor works. And so it's pumping that pressure down here to this valve block and then solenoids open and it goes where it needs to go to do the job. But you got a lot of extra hoses on the side here. And with the after treatment, we got extra um, pipes and stuff for the air. Um, we also have a the main engine gear case 
pump is up here instead of you know mounted on the end of the stack like it used to be so we got a pump driving there and then we also have another pump down here this pump is for our power cast tailboard so we have a power cast tailboard and these little paddles spin and you're able to spread the residue a lot farther especially when you're running 40 45 foot drapers you need to be able to spread that material over a wider distance so we use the help of this hydraulic pump going into this valve block which is turning two hydraulic motors on these spreaders so quite a bit of stuff on the left hand side of a newer machine that is final tier four and you know it makes it a little bit more difficult to do unload belts and this chopper jack shaft belt here because you got to take that pump off and move those air lines and stuff so it has a little extra work involved for just general maintenance of belts and hoses just to keep the air clean but that's the world we live in and we just have to deal with it all right moving down here we'll check the steering cylinder i know when you guys seen my video when i pulled a s680 out of the field um, everybody was asking me you know where i tied in those hoses to i tied them in right here right into the the steering cylinder i just took these lines off and then attached a line here and there's another one on the other side into the SCVs of the tractor so I could move the cylinder in and out. So that's where that steering cylinder is. You know, this is the rear axle tube here. Um, check this inner tie rod, make sure this boot's in good shape and that it's not loose. Check the outer tie rod, make sure it's good and tight and the boot looks good on it. Make sure we don't have excessive leakage around the wheel bearings and it looks good and then you got you know two grease points here for your your spindle um, this here is for your rear wheel angle sensor so this is measuring the angle of the rear wheels and it uses that for auto track then we check the wiring for it going back to here and then we want to also check this axle tube make sure all the bolts are there they're good and tight make sure there's no cracking in this tube anywhere and that all looks good and then we'll we'll do that on both sides as well also on these new machines we have a giant air chute on the side here and they used to be mounted back here um, but they changed that and moved it to over here um, i'm guessing it has better airflow and cleaning ability I mean, I'm not really sure their exact reason why they added these chutes here. I do know that when those air chutes were over here, they would get plugged full of stems. So maybe they work better. I don't know. But I just know that they added a larger air chute and it's more forward over here on these. So now this arm here, this swing arm, is the rear sieve swing arm. And we want to make sure that it's good and tight. So they're going to have a little movement, but I'm looking for that bushing moving excessively. So note that these swing arms, you want to replace them, all the swing arms, every 1,500 separator hours. And that's a recommendation from Deere. And I also recommend it too because... You know, you could have one bolt fail or, you know, this bushing can go out and this one arm just on this side and you can cause, you know, $12,000 worth of damage if, you know, it runs a long time broken or whatever. You know, those frames inside can just start beating themselves up. So it's a good thing to do, if, you know, general maintenance. You want to replace all the swing arms every 1,500 separator hours. It's good practice because you don't want that going down the field. So here we have the rear chaffer arm, swing arm. Move it. That's good. I'm also, you know, I'm taking note of my seal clearance here so I can compare it to the other side. Here we have our switch bank so we can move the sieve and the chaffer manually here. And here 
moving inside, there's actuators on those screens that move them in and out. This switch is for our chopper. <coughs> Two actuators that are moving the chopper. Clips falling. That's just the chopper hammers falling. So here we have our service lights up there. See, they kicked on. We got those on both sides. And then this switch here is to turn our lights inside the machine so we can look at the shoe. We'll turn that on once we go in there. Here we got the discharge beater belt. And it's a little different on this machine here. We got a different tensioner setup. We got a dual uh, idler tensioner setup here. And we also have a double rib belt, which, you know, it used to be just a single belt and a single tensioner um, pulley. So they've kind of upgraded that a little bit. And we'll just pull down on this chopper belt. And this is a good way to just turn over the machine. You can turn over this whole machine just by pulling on this belt right here. Everything will turn. So um, if you got a rotor that won't go in gear, and you just need to wiggle a little bit. Sometimes it's hard to just grab the, the rotor shiv and move it up and down. So what you can do is just have a guy here and just kind of wiggle this while you push it on that lever and it'll go into gear a lot easier. So we use this belt a lot to rotate machines over to for repairs and stuff like that. But it rotates over fairly easy like this. And what you can do So you can look at this belt as good as you can, and then you can rotate this because you want to be able to see all the belt because sometimes that belt will look perfectly fine and then you'll rotate it and there'll just be a huge split all the way through it and you would have missed it if you didn't rotate it. So let's rotate a little and look. slamming noise you're hearing is just the the chopper hammers and you'll see what I'm talking about here in a little bit. And I'm also checking these chopper belts here and I'm going to check this upper chopper jack shaft belt this three rib guy good so here we're looking at the separator drive the rotor shivs variable speed and it's got a hydraulic cylinder right here and this one's been replaced before probably because it was leaking internally into the uh the grease cavity and the common symptom is that is the rotor speed slows down on its own because the pressure bleeds off internally and goes into the shiv and then it fills this grease cavity in here full of oil and then it'll start leaking out in places it's not supposed to be like on the belt so this is the rotary union that allows this to swivel and maintain a hydraulic connection make sure that it's not leaking and it's tight so that's good you got two grease circs on here and technically from the factory they come with a square plug in the one that's on the angle. And then you see this one is straight up and down. 
that one there greases the shaft. So the splines in the shaft for this to go in and out. And then this one down here fills a grease cavity because there's dog teeth inside that mate the, the two shivs together and it's got a cavity in here. And you're supposed to take this square plug out every 400 hours and swap it with that greaser and then pump 45 pumps of grease in here. And a good way to tell if you're full or not is to speed the rotor up all the way and take this plug out and just see how much grease is in this hole here. And then, you know, you can squirt some in there and then pull that plug out. And if you got pressure grease coming out, then you know you're full. So, you, but you gotta be careful with that. Sometimes if you got worn seals, you can actually push, push grease through the seals and then leak onto your rotor belt. So you gotta be a little cautious with that, but if you speed the rotor up all the way, you're making this cavity inside here as small as possible. So whenever it's squeezed all the way together, it doesn't hydraulically try to force all that grease out. Cause if you try to fill it full of grease and this thing spread open wide, when you speed it up, it's gonna collapse and that grease has gotta go somewhere. Usually shoots it out the grease seal. So you gotta be a little cautious about that. And then while we're up here, we can check the rotor belt. And we'll rotate that around, check the condition of it. Make sure there's no splits or cracks in it. Make sure that it's dry and clean. So here we're, we're checking the, the discharge feeder bearing. We're just getting a pry bar and then like i said it helps have an indexing bar to get the right angle on there and lifting up on it you got to put a lot of pressure on it because that discharge beater weighs a lot and then you also have the belt tension on there now if you weren't able to do this and get a good bite on it what you could do is just take the belt off take it loose take the belt off the pulley and then spin it and normally if you got a bad bearing you'll be able to hear it when you spin that all right, here we're gonna check the bearings on this chopper jack shaft drive. It's got my bar wedged in there. They feel good and tight. You're looking for, you know, excessive leaking on here. And this thing is full of grease as well. That will take this cover off. This is our dual speed chopper drive. So when this shift handle is all the way in, we're in first gear. Here's neutral, you can see it just released that. Then all the way out is second gear, high speed. So all the way in for corn, all the way out for beans. Okay. So I took the unload chain off is I wanted to check the vertical gear case here. And I'm looking through this inspection hole here and I'm looking for a slop on the spline shaft going into the bottom of the vertical. And it moves with the sprocket with no slop. But you can hear slop in there. So that slop is most likely in the top where it mounts into the 90 degree gear case up in the turret. On this combine, they have a Lancota unload shutoff kit. So this shuts off the cross augers. So whenever you're unloading, you can, put, there's a foot switch in the cab and that will kill the cross augers. And then that will allow you to empty the horizontal separately. So it kind of helps on wear and tear, you know, if that horizontal is empty. So the next time you kick the unload on, this has a little module controller in it, so it has a five second delay before the cross augers kick on to allow the tube to clean out a little bit more before these cross augers kick on and send all that grain up into the turret into the unload auger. So um, these kits, you can order them through Sloan's Express. Um, I think they're about $3,000, but it helps protect the splines in the unload auger system which you know you can have you know 1800 bucks in a vertical and plus you know all the components in this lower gear case you gotta 
you know, a $1,400 gear case in the turret, and then you probably got, you know, five or $6,000 worth of augers in the tube. So I think this kit really helps save on the splines because on these combines, usually the splines will wear before the flighting gets super thin. Um, a lot of times I'll see, you know, spline failure and the flighting on the auger still looks good. So I think this system really works well on these. Um, up here, I'm gonna check the, the tensioner pulley. So when you kick the unload auger on, this cylinder up here goes down because this pulley here is always spinning, but when it's like this, the belts are loose, it doesn't catch. And you hit the unload button, this shoves down here like this, puts traction on that belt. So, let's spin these around. Still in good condition. It might be stretched a little bit, but I think they'll be all right. And also you're looking for spots for the belt that's possibly slipped and burned through into the belt. I didn't see any of that. Check the cylinder. That looks good. And we're gonna check this serpentine belt on that blower I talked about earlier. It looks like it's in good shape. Tensioner looks good. We'll get our belt adjustment here for the chopper jack shaft belt or big three rib belt. It could be adjusted a little bit. It's not too bad. Check in here. Check those bearings. So we're inside the machine here. So here we got a a dual adjust deep do tooth chaffer chaffer sorry i can't talk um you notice here you got solid louvers in the 10 rows here um, they added those in there so when cobs do ricochet off the chopper and come back that it doesn't damage the fingers like it used to so these solid louvers are a little tougher and can handle a little bit more punishment from cobs because you can see these cobs come flying back hard enough to shish kebab on these fingers here and these fingers cover the the shoe loss sensors so when corn or beans comes down here and taps on the sensor it registers that into account into the controller so we can tell if we have shoe loss back here and we check the condition of the seal here look at the bottom of the frame make sure the chaffer and sieve frames aren't hitting each other that they got a good seal let me go through and We'll check, you know, all the louvers, make sure we don't have any of them damaged on the chaffer element. And then below this, we have a sieve element. Um, we'll get in here and we'll look at all those, make sure we don't have any missing. And we'll check the condition of this extended chaffer back here and the pre-cleaner up in there. And then the condition of this return pan and the swing arms that are attached to it. Um, these holes here are those air chutes that I, were, I was showing on the side. And then we'll check the condition of the discharge beater, which it looks just like a feed accelerator on this one. And then we'll check the condition of the discharge beater concave here. And this one, they have these little, they call them nails that go through these grates and kind of act like, you know, threshing bars and you want to make sure that those aren't loose or missing. And then we'll, you know, we'll rotate this over and we'll check for damage, broken bars, excessive wear. Um, you can also rotate these wear strips just like the feed accelerator.
Okay, one thing I want to point out here is you got these veins here above the, the chopper. And some combines, you know, if they don't have the premium residue option or the veins on this side, you'll have these little knockouts here because that's where extra veins can go. But what happens is, is you get enough wear on this plate, it'll punch these holes out here. And then you'll have a leak here. You'll have material to be able to shoot through these holes. And then it'll pile up on top of your, um, your tailboard on the back. So if you do have these intact, just like these, I recommend to put some extra tacks on here with a welder and secure these in a little better so they don't knock out. Um, but if they do knock out, you can just put a plate of steel, you know, a thin sheet of metal on the outside and just stick it on with John Deere combine sealant and it'll be strong enough to hold that and keep the leak um, from getting onto your tailboard. So here we're looking at the stationary knives below the chopper. We're looking at the condition of the knives and they look good. And if they do get worn, you can take this assembly out and you can pull this rod out and then flip the knives around and then run the other side. But these look to be in good condition. And we check the bottom floor here of the chopper, make sure there's no holes or wear there. Here's the other side, the bottom part of the, the chopper the discharge chute. This is all one piece. Um, I did notice it's missing a bolt there. It looks like it's kind of bent down slightly right there. But it shouldn't be a big deal. Just put a new bolt in that hole. And then in here, these are our chopper hammers. This is what was you could hear smacking around earlier. And we're going to check the condition of the hammers. And this is what's chopping up the residue coming off the shoe and the discharge beater. So if these hammers aren't good and sharp and good condition, it'll take more horsepower to get rid of the material. And these are showing some wear. They're not absolutely trash. I've got to kick it in the neutral. I got it neutral, so... Okay, turn this. And they're getting some wear. And when you do have one of these broken, you have to replace them in sets. Um, you get a kit which has six of them in there, and then there's a chart and you have to replace them in a certain order in order to maintain balance on this chopper. And then when you do do a set of these, you replace the, the bushing and the spacers and the bolt and then the new hammers. Of course, I'm looking for ones that are broken, missing. those down as iffy. I'm checking for you know, excessive play. I mean, that's pretty typical there. It's not crazy amount of play, but they gotta be able to swivel. You wouldn't want them super tight. Okay, so one thing I want to note is, you know, when I say these you know, chopper hammers are iffy, um, when I go back to the shop, I'm going to fill out an inspection sheet on my computer. And, you know, I would look up this job and I either say it's red, it needs replaced right now, you know, and then yellow that, you know, it can possibly run another year and then green, you know, it's good to go. So, you know, something like this, when you have, you know, chopper hammers or maybe worn, you know halfway or something like that you know they're showing somewhere and there's you know they're dull or whatever you know i would put them in 
the yellow. You know, if these were just like toast and they needed a replace before next year, you know, I would put them in the red. So then, you know, the customer can look at all his red items and knows what needs replaced now. And then, you know, he can make a decision whether or not he wants to go ahead and do the yellow stuff or not. Also, a no, little note here is whenever you're checking these after treatment enclosures, you want to look for black soot, you know, leaking out of any of these covers or down around in here, you know, and that could indicate that there's a leak in the exhaust system and you can have soot, you know, building up in this housing and it'll start coming out of all the little air gaps that it possibly can. Or, you know, maybe this blower system wasn't working properly and you had, you know, excess crop material or dust getting in there and smoldering you know you could start to see maybe some discoloration right here on the bottom and you also this is a plastic shroud for this pulley and i've seen these melt right here you know if you've got an exhaust leak right here where that pipe's coming in it'll shoot extremely hot exhaust gases down here and it gets so hot where it can melt this plastic shield so something to be aware of that you need to check on a daily basis to make sure that you're not, you know, leaking exhaust or, you know, any kind of thermal event, we should say, happening inside of this after treatment enclosure. So now we're gonna check these spreader paddles on the Powercast tailboard. And you can see, you know, these are starting to wear through or it's starting to break. And eventually, you know, this chunk right in here will be completely broke off. And then at that point, you start to see some uh, like the spreader not spreading like it's supposed to be, you know, not spreading evenly or not spreading far enough. But you can see that these these paddles are breaking, cracking right here because most of the material, you know, hits really hard and it throws it out on the, the edges of these. And they do have new paddles out instead of them being straight. Um, they kind of 45 out this way and when you order new ones, that's what you're gonna get. And I think that they make a big difference in how well they spread. Um, also, there's some deflectors in here. Um, the, the customer took them off and they said that it helped it spread more in the middle, like it was spreading too much on the outside ends and not enough in the middle. Um, so there used to be a piece in here and they took those out and they said it made it work better. So there's another little helpful tip for you if you're having trouble spreading and you can help it out by maybe taking those um, shrouds out there and then also upgrading to the new paddles, especially if yours you know, looks like this. Um, putting those new style paddles on definitely helps. But also there are paddles on top of here. It's kind of hard to see you don't really know that they're there, but you can kind of see that paddle up there and that helps keep the top of that housing clean. And you can see that that's worn through all the way. And they use the same bolts here to hold those on. So you get these paddles in a kit for both sides, but they don't come with these. So you gotta make sure you order those separate and replace them at the same time. So here we got the cover off the Powercast tailboard where you can see those motors. Um, you can also kind of see those paddles on top that I was talking about too through those holes. And we just make sure there's no leaks here. Check the sensor wiring. Make sure that all looks good. All right, that's gonna do it for part two of this video. Stick around for part three. We're gonna cover um, the rest of the machine um, thanks for watching guys. I really appreciate it. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any further uh, videos that I update on the channel. Um, if you guys are looking for any new or used ag equipment, don't forget to check out uh, www.sloans.com. Um, I'm sure we got what you're looking for. Also, don't forget to check out Sloan's Express uh, website and that's www.sloanex.com. Thank you.